Good afternoon. afternoon. It's good to be here at Riverside. Uh, You have been a blessing to the Village Church. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, uh, but the Village was in a bit of a spot uh, this past fall, and uh, your church gave. Uh, It was a small grant, but you gave to our church, and uh, it made an impact. And I just kind of, I was looking through the order of worship, and we're giving to Cairn Christian School. I think sometimes you might wonder, what's this small offering? You know, what kind of difference? But you don't know the blessing that it is to, uh, to various organizations. And so very uh, grateful to be here with you and to facilitate worship. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 89, uh, verses 1 to 2. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Our call to worship, uh, or our silent prayer rather, uh, I'd like to draw attention to the sheet that's in front of you. Do, you. do you have that, the sheet? Okay, great, I see some hands, that's good, it was at the back. Uh, so I'd like to start it, uh, leave a pause, and then transition. The, the first uh, question is, what is bringing you life right now, and what is sapping your life, sapping your hope? Uh, so just kind of to, to lay all these things down before the Lord in kind of an unfiltered way, a little bit more structure to the silent prayer. Uh, Let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we read in your word that your mercies are new every morning. And so... Right now, it's the afternoon, but we've experienced your mercies. And so we just want to lay before you your graces, your gifts, uh, with thanksgiving in our hearts for one moment. Lord, for each one of us, uniquely, there are things that are sapping us, uh, draining us, struggles, suffering. And uh, we want to just lay that before you right now, uh, just in a prayerful way. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We'll close now with, Lord, listen to your children praying.
Our help is in the name of the Lord. Grace to you and peace to you. From God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're doing something a little bit different, another thing that's a little bit different this evening. Uh, we're taking requests. I'm told this isn't something you do each afternoon service. Uh, this is something we did growing up in my CRC church uh, in Cambridge. So I think it's a beautiful practice. Uh, does anyone have a song right at the front? Yes. Sorry? Jesus loves me. Okay. I think I know that one by heart. Uh, I could lead this one. I won't. Uh, okay, so uh, how about we just get the other two just so that we can get queued up? Is that a good idea? Or do we want to just start with the first one? Okay, let's do it. Yep. choice. <laughs> At the back, I see, uh, I see a hand in the boy with the colorful shirt. Mike, I can't hear. 469. 469. There we go. Oh, I love this one. So okay. good.
good song. Uh, yeah, you were, okay, sure, at the back. 427. 
like to now lead us in a prayer of intercession. I don't know Riverside very well. My first time preaching here, I've interacted a little bit with people from Riverside. To lead a prayer of intercession without knowing what's happening in your community. I just, I'm wondering if there are any specific prayer requests that I could bring before the Lord. New pastor coming in two months, is it? Two, two months. Lord willing, okay. Um, anything else? Okay, let's pray. Lord, uh, we come before your throne of grace. Just uh, grateful that we can be called your children and grateful that we can bring any request before you at any time because our position in the family is secure. And so as we go into the message and as we study your word together, we do pray that uh, your Holy Spirit, your spirit would be moving in power in each of our hearts. God, I want to pray for Riverside, uh, just that you would prepare them. Maybe there's a work that you want to do in the next couple months. There's a reason why the pastor isn't here yet. Maybe there's a new work you want to do, even in these couple months, uh, that uh, there would be an openness to that. I don't know what that is. Uh, God, may, uh, may the transition into having a, a shepherd, an under-shepherd here, may it go smoothly. Uh, may there be uh, just a grace uh, in that transition and the move for the pastor, all these all the details uh, that come with that. And uh, may you continue the good work that you are doing uh, here at Riverside with that, with the new pastor. We pray these things, trusting that uh, you are at work, you're always at work in us and around us. Amen. So our scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians 4 verses 7 to 9. Uh, so if you have a Bible, you can open your Bible to that. We kind of opened, I, I want to keep this in the front of your minds as, we're, as we read the word. Uh, we opened with this question, you know, what is giving you hope these days? What's sapping your hope these days? Just keep that in your mind as we read and uh, and during the message as well. And perhaps you just lost a job, a loved one. Uh, perhaps it's a migraine that won't go away. Perhaps it's a depression. Perhaps it's a relationship that has friction. Uh, just keep that in your mind, um, what is sapping your hope, because this passage is on suffering. Uh, we'll talk about the mystery of suffering, the pattern of suffering, and your invitation in it. I'm excited to open God's word. Let's read. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, 
but life is at work in you. Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. There's a mystery here. Asserting that death and suffering and loss is at work. Death, by its very definition, takes. I don't need to remind this congregation of that. You've had some losses in the recent months. Death, by its definition, takes and destroys. It doesn't work. After death, there's an absence of life absence of activity. What does this mean? Death is at work. There's a mystery here. I came from a family of privilege, upper middle class. Uh, when I was 14 years old, my parents had a clothing company. We had a good life. We had all that money could buy. Spent our summers at the cottage. We were comfortable. And one day all that changed. I walked out on my parents' front porch and I said, what's going on? I noticed their faces were downcast. And they said, Mark, you're too young. And I was a bit of a brat. So I said, I'm part of this family. I'm 13 years old. You're gonna tell me what's going on. They said, okay. We just lost the business. We're bankrupt. We have no clue what's next. We're losing the house. We'll probably use, lose our vehicle too. Everything gone in an instant. House, business, reputation, position in the community. From there, things got worse. My parents struggled with mental health, uh, my older brother developed a s very serious drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, my younger brother, a very serious gaming addiction. Uh, you'd have to bring the food to his computer. Like, that's how bad it was. You couldn't pry him off of that thing. And it, in, in many ways, you could look, you could say, that was the worst thing that ever could have happened to that family. The death of the business. But the death of the business went to work. And it became the best thing that ever happened to us. It resulted in a dependence on God in prayer for my parents. And it resulted in the mysterious transformation of each person in my family. We had nothing. We, we had nothing but God. We had to turn to God. God used the death of the business to work spiritual life into our family over the course of a decade. I asked you what's sapping your hope, what crack in the world wears on you. Um, there's a, a lady right now in our church who's in the hospital and it's, it's very sad. Um, it was kind of a preventable infection and she had major surgery and they've removed her bowel and it's really, really sad. And uh, so you say suffering and pain, are you really, does this make sense that it's at work? Um, they're evil, the result of the fall. How can they be at work? Somehow, God overrules them. Somehow the life of Jesus gets revealed in our body. Um, this woman right now, um, she's been estranged from her family and all of a sudden that family is reaching out. There's, there's beautiful relationships that are being rekindled with her kids. Those things were dead. God's taking the, the suffering that she's experiencing and there's a new life in her. Um, 
in the 1950s, six men were digging a ditch and at Aylmer, they all went to Aylmer CRC. The ditch fell on them, they all died. They all had young kids. I was talking to my wife's mom, my mother-in-law, and she said, you know what? But those kids who lost, they all lost their, think, think about it, six, six men, young men in this church, all die, one accident. My, my mother-in-law said, those kids were then raised by our church. She said, our church is the caring, loving community that it is today because of those kids. As they received all that love, all that care, and now they're just pouring it out into our community. You could say, oh, Mark, maybe that's just an example. You know, there's, that's just a couple examples anecdotally. How can you see this on a larger scale? Joseph was an arrogant young man. He was hated by his brothers. His brothers, in anger, sold him. They sold him into a life of slavery in Egypt. Doubtless, Joseph prayed many, many times. God, save me from slavery. Into slavery he went, and he experienced years and years and years of slavery, imprisonment. Joseph's character grew, and through many twists and turns, he eventually rose up to become the prime minister of Egypt. Wild. In that role, he served to save thousands of lives, even his own family, from starvation. And it all came from his evil brothers selling him into slavery. There's this beautiful line, the very end, Genesis. Joseph's dad has died. Verse 15 when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and take this opportunity now to kill us. So like, this has been a game all along. Joseph's never liked us. He's always hated us. Perhaps Joseph, he'll take this opportunity now to kill us. They approached him, please forgive us and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant the slavery for good in order to bring about the saving of our people. Now therefore, do not be afraid, I will provide for you. If God had not allowed the years of Joseph's suffering, he never would have been such a powerful agent for the redemption of his people. See, we're talking about the mystery of suffering. Joseph knew the reason behind his suffering. He could see it at that phase in his life. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble, but we're not promised that when we experience suffering, we'll know all the reasons for it. like Joseph did. Sometimes you know the death of a business, the death of a few good men. You can kind of see now looking back the slavery of a man. Sometimes we know, but sometimes we don't know. Um, look at the women at the empty tomb. In that moment, they didn't know. It, it should be on your sheet, the text. It, it, it ends with them trembling and bewildered. <laughs> They're confused. They're afraid. They fled because they were afraid, the text says. None of the disciples knew, not one of them said, don't worry, this is all part of the plan. <laughs> not one of them. They didn't understand what they had to go through. It was inexplicable suffering to them. 
And this inexplicable suffering, it continues. No explanation is given by God in this present moment why the past couple years, 120,000 Russians, 70,000 Ukrainians have died in a war. And then in Israel, 30,000. This inexplicable suffering. Feels like it's just a statistic, but those are human lives. It seems like they're just lost so needlessly. I don't know the reason why. Look at the homeless. I, I live on Oakdale in St. Catharines, and uh, there's people kind of almost on my front lawn who don't have a house. They're living in a tent. And why is it that they were born to, into a family where their parents were drug addicts and not me? Not you. you know, uh, my wife and I just had a, a baby and uh, around the same time, her co- my wife's cousin had a baby and was born without a tumor suppressor gene. So this baby's like just getting cancer, 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 cancer. It's like, why that? Why that baby? Why not my baby? Sometimes we don't know why, and there's a mystery to how pain and suffering are, are working. In our text, we opened with, it closes with, the, there, there, there's this pattern. Death is at work. It's just a pattern. And just because you can't imagine the good that can come, just because you can't imagine a reason why God would allow something to happen, doesn't mean that there is no reason at all. If there's a time to trust that there's a pattern of death giving birth to new life, it's right after Easter. (laughs) Like, this is the time. Uh, I love this illustration from Tim Keller. He says, in a little acorn can come a huge tree. Out of the tree can come innumerable other trees. It's been said one little acorn in time could fill a continent with wood. One acorn, a continent with wood. So you have the acorns planted, there's the tree, and then there's thousands of acorns. Each acorn, when planted, will produce thousands more. So it can fill a whole continent with wood. This, but not unless that acorn dies. As Jesus would say, not unless it falls to the ground and dies is the power released. Every human soul is made in the image of God. You, 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 yeah, you, yeah. You're made in the image of God. You have the potential for greatness for compassion, for amazing acts of love. But it won't be released. There won't be that that life without crucifixion, without death. This is the pattern. God will engulf suffering into something great. And we look at the worst thing that could ever happen, Jesus on the cross. Jesus took suffering and death on the cross, and he transformed it into something great. Jesus' resurrection and then the salvation of billions of lives. This was true for Jesus, how Jesus overruled suffering. Will it be true for you? Will God overrule the, the thing in your life that's just sapping your energy, and will he turn that to new life? Jesus said, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. This is the whole point of the sermon. So if you 
ignored everything, if you f fell asleep at the back, what's the pain or suffering that you want to give to God in prayer and trust that somehow, some way, you don't see it now, something good will come out of it? What's the pain or suffering you want to give to God and trust that somehow, some way, some good will come out of it? When we take the Lord's Supper, we drink normal juice, we eat normal bread, but what we acknowledge is that Christ's very power and very presence is there, transforming us at work. Just like a normal meal, our bodies break it down, that meal is breaking us down. And Jesus' death is working new life into us. When we take the cup, it's to believe that as the death of an acorn leads to new life, so my suffering will lead to new life. So the suffering in all of creation, as far as the curse is found, will somehow lead to new life. So we talk about the mystery of suffering, the pattern of suffering, your invitation in suffering. A few verses down in our text, you can look at it in your Bible, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. We learn, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. As Christians, we're not asked to kind of treat our pain and our suffering and our loss and our sacrifice as joy. You know, Jesus wasn't giggling on the cross. He was taking the weight of our sin. He was taking, he was experiencing pain. We're just asked to bring all that pain, all that suffering, all that loss, all that heartache, whatever it is that you've identified in your heart in that question, we're asked to put that adversity into a broader perspective. Uh, in the future is the new heavens and the new earth, the restoration of the world, and uh, the life that we've always wanted. That means that wherever you're at, something better is coming. I don't know where you're at right now, but wherever you're at, something better is coming. Revelation 21 verse four tells us that one day after the earth is gone, there's a new heavens and a new earth. And Jesus reigns in every way from the throne and that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes that there'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. This is good news. Imagine being in the presence of God. No more loss, no more sickness, no more rejection, no more heartache, no more shame, no more grief, no more depression, no more abuse, no more loneliness, no more fear, no more crying yourself to sleep, no more pain, but we're not there yet. Something better's coming, but we're not there yet. We're to have faith. Dostoevsky talks about how one day all suffering will be made up for. This is a quote. I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for. That all the absurdity of life, I believe, will vanish. I believe that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, for all the bloodshed, 
that will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify what has happened. End quote. Basically he's saying, I believe evil, suffering, pain, death will ultimately be the servant of joy. God doesn't waste evil. Remember the ditch diggers? Remember the, the bankruptcy? Remember Joseph? You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. A friend of mine, whenever he's tested by Satan, whenever he has a sense that there's spiritual power that's, that he's battling against, um, he always says, you know, God is going to use this. <laughs> I don't talk to Satan. I don't bother. I don't give him the time of day, but that's what he does. He says, you know, God is going to use this because God doesn't waste anything. One of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Not a bunch of things. Not most things. <laughs> all things. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. That's true for me. It's true for you. And your work and my work I'm just the paper boy today. Your work, my work, is to hold on to that hope. All things he's working for good. So for those who are suffering right now or hurting, what I want you to know is God's hurting with you. And what may feel like the worst day in your life, and it may be the worst thing, it may be far worse than a business bankruptcy. But there could come a day, weeks, months, years later, where you look back on that worst thing and you say, I wouldn't want anyone to go through it. I don't want to go through it again. But I did experience the power of God, the presence of God, the love of God through it. So if you're hurting, if you're wondering, where is God? Remember, you're living in the not there yet. But the good news is that by grace, by the grace, by the power, by the glory, by the goodness of God, something better is coming. This is our story. Let's pray. Father, today I want to pray on behalf of that one person here, maybe, who's hurting and needs this prayer. We want to push into your presence for this person and ask God that in the name of Jesus, that in the middle of the hurt and the heartache and the grief and the pain, that you would start to reveal your goodness. Maybe not your grand plan. Maybe not make sense of everything, but even if just for a moment that Lord, this person could sense your presence with them. And Lord, I want to pray for miracles. I want to pray for provision. I want to pray for restoration. And that one thing that is sapping energy, that one thing that is leading one to struggle with hope. God, I want to pray for a peace from heaven that goes beyond all understanding. And God, when we're asking why and when we don't understand, God, we ask that you would bring us back to the empty tomb. They too were asking why. They too didn't understand. But you did. God, we thank you that you're a God who lets us come to you. Help us to do this to cling to you, to trust you, even and especially when we don't understand. God, I pray that over a lifetime of walking with you, 
that there would be testimonies in this church that even though we may hurt for a moment, that we could conclude that we really do live in a world where death is at work for your glory and for our good. Amen. We'll now stand. Do you invite to stand after sitting through a long sermon? Now stand for our singing of our God, O oh God, our help in ages past. We're now taking up an offering for a Cairn Christian School. Lord, your word says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Lord, we have teachers at Cairn Christian School teaching our children to number their days that they may have hearts of wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would equip them for this work, that you would fill them with your spirit, that their teaching would not just be from a textbook, but that it would be from their own lives of being able to share as we opened our scripture, uh, this, as we opened our service, of, of your faithfulness, uh, that they might let their lives speak as well, and that these kids may grow uh, in the knowledge and the fear of you. Would you take our loaves and fishes that we offer this evening and be a blessing to this school? In the mighty name of our Lord, we pray. Amen. We'll now sing our doxology to God be the glory.
My prayer is that whatever happens this week, that you might have a glimpse of how death is at work in your life for your joy, for God's glory. I'd like to close with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious towards you. May he turn his face towards you and give you his peace.